How scandalous of Gibson. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, The Trogly's Guitar Show. I've got a really cool tale to share with you guys on this one. I believe this is a custom shop runoff model that we'll be talking about in 20 years. So how did I find out about these? Let me tell you while we're getting this thing out. So I recently had a new guitar day order for one of the Peter Frampton Les Paul customs. Unfortunately, the usual new guitar day dealers, they didn't have any in stock, so I had to message a whole bunch of other places. And one of them was Bizarre Guitars over in Reno. And even though they didn't get back to me in time to purchase that guitar from them, they invited me to check out anything else that I might be interested in their shop and I ran across this very strange listing, a custom shop Les Paul Deluxe, something that does not exist on Gibson USA's website. So obviously I was intrigued, we worked a deal on it and then they're like, hey, we got one of those Noel Gallagher's too if you're looking, it's like, oh my goodness, you guys just saved me. So if anything, thank you Bizarre Guitar. They helped me get the Noel guitar so we could review it and we get to talk about this weird freaky thing. So let's go ahead and open it up. But before we crack into this case, look, there's a Gibson custom shop hat. It. I'm not sure if that's a bizarre guitar type thing or if it actually came with this guitar, but I'm keeping that. That's cool. Thank you. But what sleeps inside here is something that I'm just going to stir up a whole bunch of controversy about it because I seriously believe this is a runoff model of the Mike Ness Les Paul Deluxe. So inside here sleeps a wine red custom shop deluxe. The custom shop has not done a Les Paul Deluxe just as a deluxe model ever, as far as I'm concerned. Like Gibson USA has done it a couple of times here and there. But outside of an artist signature model like the Mike Ness or any of the Pete Townsend models, they just don't do them. Probably because it's more costly to produce these than what a vintage original one will run you on the vintage market. So. Naturally, when I see a custom shop deluxe, it's like, yeah, we need to pick this thing up because it's actually marketed and advertised as a 1976 deluxe. <laughs> that is just completely matching what the Mike Nesses were. So here's my thoughts on this. We have a custom shop deluxe. It's got a two piece top. It's got the reflector knobs. It's got the big old headstock with the awesome pancake body construction. It's got the three piece maple neck with a honking volute and a 2022 serial number. And based on the story that they told me that Reno was offered these guitars on a hot list from the custom shop. Now I've heard of that happening before, all the way back when like Dave's guitars up in Wisconsin got a whole bunch of CC aging prototype guitars. That's like where the Kazuyoshi Saito prototype that I documented came from. Occasionally, Gibson will send this list out when they have things in their shop that they want to sell. Sometimes even non-authorized Gibson dealers get them, just like big name shops if they're really having trouble selling stuff, which isn't necessarily the case nowadays. Bizarre, I think they had like between three or four of these. I'm not entirely sure. I picked the one with the coolest wood grain, and I think they're only left with one if you're looking for a brand new one, but Fuller's and Houston got it. Played Again Music in Ohio, they had at least one, and they were all listed as brand new. But get this, they were five thousand dollars now the mike ness is essentially the exact same guitar except for it has p90 pickups which you could easily modify one of these with but it's the gold top it had mr horsepower on it and it was murphy lab aged now those things were four thousand dollars more expensive at nine thousand which made them a tough guitar to justify purchasing unless you're a big mike ness fan because again you can buy a vintage deluxe $4,000 buys you a pretty clean one. You're shelling out big, big money, 5,000 at the max. So theory one is these are converted Mike Ness deluxes because they didn't sell all that well. Like they did good enough. However, I don't think that's necessarily the case because like maybe if this was two or three years down the line, I mean, they're not just gonna refinish a Mike Ness Les Paul deluxe just because it didn't sell within a couple of months. I think what this is, it's a runoff guitar, and it's because of that pancake body that makes me think that. So, in manufacturing, if you're making 100 Mike Ness Deluxes, obviously you're gonna need to have a little bit more than that to account for shrink, you know, things that don't turn out, warped necks or bodies that just don't quite work. There's a lot of scrap wood at Gibson. So judging by the fact that there were probably at least 10 to 15 of these things made that I know of, I bet these are just the shrink bodies that they wanted to use somehow, but yet they didn't want to just make a new custom shop deluxe model. They just wanted to make a couple of them, get them out the door to use up old inventory instead of being wasteful. I could be completely off the mark here. Maybe they're just thinking now's the time, custom shop deluxe. Because I really like the Mike Ness deluxe. I thought it was insanely expensive for what it is. 
But I have vintage original deluxes in my collection. Here's one of my natural ones. I also have the blue sparkle top. But in many ways, the custom shop ones just feel better. Because remember, there was no custom shop when the original deluxes were made. They were just standard USA line production guitars. Now you can find Nashville made ones as well as Kalamazoo. So I guess you could say Kalamazoo was the custom shop of the 70s. But this is a lighter guitar. It feels like it's going to be a little bit more resonant. I mean, sure, it doesn't have the history and heritage of this one. And this one is not a pancake body because it's a 77. That's why they're calling these a 76 Deluxe. But I just like it any time that Gibson reissues the 70s model. And, you know, there's kind of a little bit of an interesting story behind these. So I had to document it. Had to document one of these things. So sure, you could buy a vintage original for the same price. But, you know, sometimes it's fun just to have a reissue. Something you don't have to worry about dinging up and playing playing too much if you're buying like a really clean collector grade one now this one's on my website if anybody wants to pay me good money for it <laughs> but until then i'm just going to keep this one in my collection because i want one of every deluxe color in my collection just because they're cool they might not be my favorite guitars in the world i definitely prefer p90s over mini humbuckers but they can be fun they've got their own history behind them but let's see what kind of case candy we might have got here Looks like a beautiful COA booklet that reads 76 LP Deluxe, matching serial number and all. Regular Gibson warranty information here. Also calling it a 76 Deluxe. And a spare backplate in case you don't want the medallion silica packet and regular hang tags. And it's the plush gray interior on this one with the compartment lid in here. Looks like we're back to Costa Rican made cases. Although, surprisingly, not extra heavy like they were back in like the 2015s era. All right, without any further ado, let's go ahead and throw this bad boy on the workbench to, you know, take an in-depth look at all its parts and specs. All right, inside the Mystery Deluxe. So when I first saw these, I thought they were just like made to measures for this particular dealer, but then I saw them at a few other places and they told me the rest of the story. However, I'm not going to rule out the fact that these could have been like an abandoned made to measure for a dealer that just decided that they didn't want them after all, because the pickup cavities tell us a lot about this guitar. So when we remove our neck mini humbucker, it's really tight. If you compare this route to the Mike Ness route over here, you can see they are completely different. The mic was routed specifically for P90 pickups, whereas these guys actually utilize the usual base plates. You can see the three screws that they have in here and we can also tell that there were never p90s installed in this since we don't have any screw holes going through here for the height adjustment so that means these were definitely made the way they were supposed to be made which honestly just confuses me about these things even more unless these bodies just weren't routed yet and they're still mike ness runoffs but you can't see it's a short neck tenon so that's actually correct for a 76 Deluxe. Well, depending on where it came from, you might be able to find a transitional neck tenon yet, but I'll consider this correct. But how's this for another layer of mystery? A mid-2018 Les Paul Rhythm Deluxe pickup. What on earth? Maybe they were just trying to use up old parts and they're like, hey, we just did these. Why don't we make a couple of more? Because our bridge pickup shares a similar date, although it has a slightly different font. But this pickup cavity looks like this. I found it interesting. There's like a large splinter of wood right there that wasn't routed out. And I'm not sure if that was there on purpose or not to like support the base plate or if it was just an error, but it's firmly attached. I guess now that I look closer at the neck pickup cavity, that little splinter is also there, so it must be there for the base plate. And here you can see our two-piece maple top joining onto the mahogany body. Now don't worry, we're still going to get the readings on the pickups, but this is so bizarre. I was trying to do it earlier and I kept getting zero readings, and it's like, that can't be right, it's a brand new guitar, there's no way that it doesn't work straight from the factory. But then I plug it in when I get it all put back together, and it's like... No sound. So I'm looking in the back. Everything's looking okay. Looking at the output jack. Everything looks all right there. So it's like, ah, did I mess something up with the pickups? It's kind of funny. If you have the pickup down this low, it just stops working because something shorts out, I think, with the three-way switch and the base plate. So if I just loosen this a little bit, everything starts to work again. But if you tighten it, it all goes away. Now, thankfully, I mean, I, that should be raised up a little bit anyway, so we're, we're all good here. So our bridge pickup is 6.27k ohms, our neck position a little bit less at 6.23, and the middle just for fun, 3.12. Now, as far as how accurate this is to a true 76 Deluxe, it's the exact same things that the Mike Ness didn't get right. It's a, a two-piece maple top, whereas an original 76 would 100% have a three-piece top. But that's like the only big 
error, and they might have just did it to make it a slightly different thing in a more desirable spec. I told you guys I chose this top because it's so beautiful. This looks like a 70s top, I mean, besides being two pieces, but it's got a little bit of flame in certain areas. I mean, the 70s, you can find a flame top one if you're really lucky, but usually it's pretty intermittent. But you will find nice wavy wood grains like this, so I mean, this was a must-have for me. I mean, all the other ones were pretty plain, so this one in comparison, it's like, that, that was the other reason that pushed me over the top that I had to document this and I wasn't even completely sold then until I realized that yeah it's also got the pancake body construction which if you don't know it's a big old slab of mahogany then it has a little slab of maple and then another slab of mahogany that's something that Gibson did from about 1969 to about 1976 I mean you can find them all the way until 79 but generally they start to phase them out around 76. But this has a Nashville Tunematic style bridge. Uh, is that correct or not? It, it depends. Do you have a Nashville made one or a Kalamazoo made one? You can potentially still find an ABR one deluxe if it was Kalamazoo made. But this is what they did for the Mike Ness, so they did it here. And just like the Mike Ness, they utilize a lightweight aluminum tailpiece, which is not a correct spec for a 76. Some artistic liberties were taken to bring this into this generation of guitars. Oh, we've got our golden reflector bonnet knobs. They're looking good. We don't have any thumb bleeders on them. Here's a quick look at the pick card. Nothing too crazy. Moving on to our fretboard here. It's rosewood as it should be, and you've got your acrylic trapezoid inlays all looking pretty good. The frets are definitely a little bit taller than the vintage ones, so maybe that's why you'd want a modern day custom shop versus an original. Among other things, like generally the originals will have fret wear and other things like that. Finish wear that you may or may not enjoy. But those frets are 0 0.058 inches tall. We've got 22 of them, and it's got that 12 inch fretboard radius. And our nut measure is 1.65 inches, and increases to 2.04 by the 12th. And how thick is our neck? 0.85 at the first, and by the 12th it's one. So yeah, that, that's a very 70s characteristic neck. You start to get the heel though, so it's better to take it at like the 10th fret. And that's only 0.93, so it's not quite as chunky as those numbers might have made it seem. I would definitely say this is a slim 70s neck profile. Here's the neck at the first fret and the 12th fret. I mean, it just stays very consistent, a slim C. And of course, we've got this giant headstock, but the same thing that I complimented the Mike Ness Deluxe on, they've nailed that logo. It's perfect. Here's my 77, but the logo's consistently changed in the late 70s, but it's got the same flair to it. And they've got the obnoxiously wide boat paddle head stock that these things are characteristically known for. I mean, if you're in the know, this is a, a cute, charming factor. However, if you like 50 specs, you're probably like, why would anybody want that? <laughs> Another awesome spec are the double ring Clusen tuners that use the vintage style bushings instead of the screw on style. And your truss rod's looking good on this one. The truss rod cover reads deluxe in a very similar font as to what it should be. Now we'll move over to the back side. So the electronics cavity is very similar to the Mike Ness. Now this one had a little bit of extra paint over it to not get finished right here, like because sometimes they like to write things as compared to the Mike Ness that you can see over here. But you've got the Gibson branded pots and they're all wired up. Not exactly 70s style. They don't have the shielding tin and all that, but can you really expect them to do it? That'd be pretty costly to remanufacture something that's just not as good as a traditional ground wire that they've put in here. But there we can also see our pancake body construction. That's our maple ridge in the center. And then up here, we can see our toggle switch. Nothing too fancy here, but I did see a massive oversight. So this is what comes on the guitars because it's the 70th anniversary of the Les Paul why on earth they didn't do a commemorative 1952 reissue this year, I have no idea. They could have sold a lot of those. But they gave us a black backplate to replace that with. But the problem is, is this comes stock from the factory with light brown. So <laughs> you don't have the option to switch. You're, you're going to be mix matching no matter what. But awesome mahogany wood grain back here. Looks like a one piece back. I don't know. Do you technically count a sandwich body as a one piece back? Because I mean, it's technically three, but 
You don't have seam lines, so it's wide enough to be that way. The rumor is that Gibson started to do the whole sandwich bodies back then because they couldn't find thick enough wood. So this was actually a little bit more labor intensive to make, but they didn't have to piece things together and make it look really shoddy like they do the top. <laughs> We've got our thick binding in the cutaway, but my goodness, Gibson, this is the worst scraping job I have ever seen on a Gibson guitar. So this is the maple stripe, right? But you can almost like see another one right here. That's where they didn't finish scraping the binding's edge. So you're seeing the finish over top of the binding. And that is pretty even along this entire guitar. I mean, it's really apparent in some areas. And this is the treble side. Wait till you see the bass side. Yeah, that's really bad. That should have all been scraped off. However, I kind of like it because it almost looks like another layer of maple. So it gives it a little bit of character, but technically that's a huge defect where they just really rush this one out the door. But critique mixed with a compliment, this is a maple neck. They've matched the color pretty well. Because normally when you have a colored finish, like let's say a light blue color, over top of a maple neck, it turns green like with the Les Paul Futuras. This matches really well. I mean, for example, this is a natural finish. It's the exact same finish that's on the body for the 77, but the maple neck is just so much brighter. So maybe this was just a naturally darker maple wood, or this is a really serious stain. But it's so dark from photos, I thought it was mahogany, but definitely in person you can see it's maple. Once you see wood grain looking like this. And the three-piece neck, I mean, it makes it a little stronger. You've got the volute. I personally like them, but that's because I like 70s specs and models. But double ring, double line Gibson Deluxe tuners, also a cool factor. And there's the serial number for this one, dating it to 2022. All said and done though, this one only weighs 8 pounds, 12.7 ounces, so a little under 9 pounds. And let me just tell you, like a good weight for a Norland era Les Paul Deluxe is 9.5 pounds, so that's another reason why you might consider one of these. It's just a little bit... So it's going to sound different from the Mike Ness Deluxe because we got mini humbuckers, so let's go ahead and give this thing a whirl. Let's go ahead and run through the tones of this. That was just the neck pickup. That's so nice and juicy. If you knew some jazz chords, it'd probably go really well. Now the middle position. Now we'll try a little bit with a pick. middle position. It's nice and chimey is the best way to put it. Honestly, this is one of the best mini humbucker equipped guitars I've played. Let's kick on some dirt. Thank you. 
you expect out of mini humbuckers. They're very bright sounding, so definitely adjust your amp settings accordingly. But for me, this thing is all about the clean tones. And that neck pickup is just so sweet. <laughs> But it can get pretty nasty with solos as well. Now just for fun here, I'm gonna play my 77 Deluxe a bit. Remember, it doesn't have the exact same body. The strings are different. The pickups are true vintage. Let's just see, does it sound similar? Okay. <laughs> These pickups are way better. Instantaneously, wow, wow. Maybe I shouldn't have done the comparison. <laughs> this neck pickup, way lively. However, that other one has like a bit of a meatiness that this one doesn't have. So I think it just depends what you're going for. The neck profile on this one's definitely a little bit slimmer than the reissue, and the volute's not as big on this one. Let's try a bit of distortion. <laughs> Now that we know all about the new Custom Shop 76 Les Paul Deluxe that may or may not have just been made of runoff mic nest bodies and necks. I've gotta say, I was really digging this guitar up until the point that I plugged my vintage one in again. And it's like, wow, yeah, that it's kind of a night and day difference. Like this is a very good tribute. If you want a neck that's just a little bit bigger than a vintage deluxe, you're gonna like this. If you want frets that are just a little bit taller and you want a modern day instrument that has a warranty, but still has like all the vintage flair to it, that's exactly who this is for. I'm sure most people would actually find this one more comfortable to play. It's lighter in weight and the neck feels just a little bit better. But if you're used to the 70s necks like I kind of am, and most importantly, the weight, there is a certain quirky charm to these flatter fret Norlin guitars with the ultra skinny necks. However, if you're a collector guy, I mean, why not have one of each? Because they each have their own unique characteristics to them. Like the neck pickup on this one is just so ridiculously juicy, great for the jazzy stuff. Whereas this one, I mean, it's a little bit more spankier. It just kind of depends what are you trying to go for here? But for me, I'd probably just stick with my regular vintage deluxe, but I had a great time checking this one out and learning a little bit about its history. Even though we don't have the full answer on this one, I think it'd be cool if the 76 deluxe just became a new thing in Gibson's lineup. However, if I'm being honest here, I'm not quite sure how many they would actually be able to sell unless they start offering like the sparkle top deluxe colors, or at least offer some other colors. I mean, wine red, not the most popular deluxe color out there. But anyways, troglodytes, if you're interested and being the next owner of this one, you can check it out on my website. Or if this one's already sold, you can check them out at any of the dealers that I mentioned in this video. Just go to Reverb Search Custom Shop Bless Paul Deluxe. You'll find one for sale. All right, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.